Securities and Exchange Act of 1934. It's a five-minute vote. Ahead of this series of votes, the House, by a voice vote, approved the short-term continuing resolution funding the federal government through uh, January the 18th this Saturday so that they can finish work on the omnibus spending bill, which would fund the government through the rest of the fiscal year. We get more from a Capitol Hill reporter. As Congress begins consideration of the fiscal year 2014 omnibus spending bill, we're joined by Eric Wasson of The Hill. What are some of the top line details we should know about this bill? Well, this uh, spending bill is about a trillion dollars in total. It's $1.012 trillion. It flushes out the details of the Ryan Murray budget pact that passed Congress in December. This is a true bipartisan compromise. The negotiators worked all the way until Sunday evening to hash out policy differences throughout the federal government's budget. And it includes uh, compromises on what were originally 134 policy riders. These are policy limitations on everything from preventing the post office from discontinuing Saturday mail, that's in the bill, to preventing the Export-Import Bank from blocking funds for coal plants overseas. That was an important priority for House Appropriations Committee Chairman Hal Rogers. That's in the bill. There are other things that were not in the bill. Uh, there's no provision blocking all funding for Obamacare. That's the issue that shut down the government for 16 days in October. However, conservatives can point to the fact that a billion dollars has been taken out of the Obamacare Prevention Fund, which they've often derided as a slush fund that uh, Health and Human Services Secretary Sebelius can dip into to bolster Obamacare uh, funding. And, and overall, Obamacare funding is held at the post-sequestration level, so there's no new funding for Obamacare. Well, 2014, an important year for U.S. efforts in Afghanistan. How does the, uh, the omnibus handle war funding? Well, war funding is at $92 billion, which is on the high end. That's what the House was seeking, and this will help uh, the Pentagon deal with what is a funding cut. It's about $20 billion in base funding reduction from what the House had sought. So uh, it was a pretty uh, strong number. Uh, aid to the Afghan government, however, is limited. There are policy provisions which would require a uh, bilateral security uh, agreement in order for full funding to the Afghan government. Uh, and, uh, and additionally, in that section, there is also new uh, limitations on uh, aid to Egypt as well, which uh, saw a coup and its, its uh, funding limited uh, by the administration. And now it will have to meet certain democracy objectives uh, to receive its full military assistance as well. And you reported on some, uh, some language in the bill ch changing or reverting back to uh, some of the benefits that were, uh, that were taken away, the military benefits. Tell us more about that. That's right. The Ryan Murray uh, budget deal cut about $85 billion in spending over 10 years in order to boost uh, spending in the near term on the discretionary side. And how they got to that uh, overall cut uh, involved a cut to military pensions of about $6 billion. This is the cost of living uh, adjustment for military retirees, and it's proven quite controversial. Uh, even among uh, normally deficit hawks on the Republican side, and there's a big effort in the Senate uh, uh, by Democrats and Republicans to reverse that. This bill does not completely reverse the pension cut. Instead, it just ad addresses how it affects disabled veterans and survivors of, of uh, members of the military who, were, who have been uh, killed uh, or who have died while in service. Uh, this would uh, exempt them from the cut, and that is part of uh, this deal. Well, on to the politics of getting this through the House and Senate. First, the House, you tweeted earlier about Republican leaders saying that the leaders are starting to sell the $1 trillion omnibus to the rank and file. How are they going about doing that? Well, that's right. Already there's, uh, there was talk about it in this morning's uh, conference meeting among uh, House Republicans. They're really pointing out that this is bringing discretionary funding back to the last year of the Bush administration before the Obama stimulus. It's a lower number than was in uh, one of the first uh, Paul Ryan budgets. Uh, and they're emphasizing that there are a lot of conservative principles, including uh, on Obamacare, as I mentioned, that are in here and, and worth uh, going for. A lot of the members have just started to review the bill. It's 1,582 pages. It dropped uh, at 8 p.m. last night. So when I was talking to them, they were still reviewing it. And some of them have very local concerns. You know, Representative Jason Chaffetz, a, a true conservative, but so, someone who also can side with leadership when it makes sense for him, was concerned uh, about uh, a, a land provision, uh, payment in lieu of taxes that relates to uh, rural communities and payments to, to local government. So people are bringing up uh, individual uh, pieces of the bill that they're worried about and talking to leaders about how that might be addressed and 
other legislative vehicles. So there's a, there's a real conversation going on, and there'll be a whip check during today's votes, which uh, uh, start uh, early in the afternoon. Well, on the Democratic side, with the administration, you report supporting the uh, omnibus spending measure. Does that make it easy for House Democrats to go ahead and favor the bill? I think so. I think there'll probably be a strong uh, House Democratic vote. Uh, Steny Hoyer, the uh, minority whip who opposed the budget deal because it didn't do enough to create a grand bargain to deal with long-term deficits, has said he will support uh, this measure. So I think uh, there's going to be a, a strong vote. But we're still, uh, you know, talking to members and seeing uh, if they have concerns. There are cuts to. Uh, you know, uh, National Institutes of Health funding and certain programs, uh, especially in the education department, that may uh, deter some, especially liberal members, uh, from voting for it. Read more from Eric Wasson at thehill.com and follow him on Twitter at E.L. Wasson. Thanks for the update. Uh, thanks so much for having me. On this vote, the yeas are 417, the nays are 4, two-thirds two -thirds being in the affirmative, the rules are suspended, the bill is passed, and without objection, a motion to reconsider is laid on the table. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, the unfinished business is a question on agreeing to the Speaker's approval of the journal on which the yeas and nays were ordered. The question is on agreeing to the Speaker's approval of the journal. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This is a five-minute vote. And it's a, the last in the series to vote on the approval of the journal, the official written record of the previous day's activities. It's a five-minute vote. 
And as you may be noticing on the, the House floor, these votes have gone a little bit longer. Yesterday, House Majority Whip Kevin McCarthy was quoted as saying he, he planned on whipping for the omnibus spending bill during this series of votes. And uh, the, certainly the first vote, which was scheduled for 15, went nearly a, a half an hour or so. This is after now the House passing the, the short term, the continuing resolution, which allows them to keep the government funded through Saturday so that the House and Senate can finish work on the uh, omnibus spending bill for the remainder of fiscal year 2014. What we expect to happen next is that the, the House has a couple of bills to debate. We expect them to gavel out to recess sometime after finishing debate on those and return in the uh, 5 o'clock Eastern hour or so for votes on those if votes are called for. If we get the chance, we are planning to take you live to Trenton to hear from Governor Christie, the State of the State address is scheduled for 3 p.m. Eastern. If we're able, we will take you there live here on C-SPAN.
On this vote, the yeas are 274, the nays are 138. There are three present not voting. The journal is approved. Members will remove your conversations off the floor. What purpose does the gentleman in Texas seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I move the House suspend the rules and pass H.R. 2860. Clerk will report the title of the bill. Union calendar number 191, H.R. 2860, a bill to amend Title V United States Code to provide that the Inspector General of the Office of Personnel Management may use amounts in the revolving fund of the office to fund audits, investigations, and oversight activities and for other purposes. Pursuant to the rule, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Farenthold, and the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummins, will each control 20 minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I yield myself as much time as I may consume. Without objection. I'd also like to ask for unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days in which to revise and extend their remarks and exclude extraneous material on the bill under consideration. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you very much. Mr. Speaker, H.R. 2860 responds to the Office of Personnel Management Inspector General's call for increased oversight of the OPM's revolving fund. By providing the IG access to a portion of that revolving fund money for oversight. H.R. 2860 recognizes oversight as a legitimate business cost by using existing funds to help the IG respond to the increased referrals of alleged fraud within the OPM's revolving fund operation, including especially in the background investigation used to determine an individual's eligibility for a security clearance. The Office of Personnel Management serves as a regulator for these rules affecting the management of federal workers, but has also evolved into a fee-based service provider that provides billions of dollars in service each year to the very agencies governed by OPM's rules. The revolving fund's budget Speaker, has grown significantly over the past Mr. 15 Speaker, years, from $191 million... The House is in not in order. Gentleman's correct. The House is not in order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Gentlemen, will proceed. The revolving funds budget has grown significantly over the past 15 years, as I was saying, from $191 million to more than $2 billion today. OPM's revolving fund budget is almost 91% of the OPM's uh, budget. Yet the resources available for the IG to audit these funds have not kept pace with the growing amounts. For over 30 years, both the General Accountability Office and OPM Inspector Generals uh, ha have been concerned about the management of resources in the revolving fund. Each has issued a number of reports and audits examining various uh, and often recurring problems. Last year, OPM Inspector General McFarland informed the Committee on Government Oversight and Reform of what he described as serious problems uh, inhibiting his ability to perform the duties and responsibilities of his office. McFarland stated his office was at a point where it could not meet its statutory obligation to effectively
effectively oversee revolving fund activities. He noted that his office has been inundated with requests from OPM to audit and or investigate different parts of revolving fund programs. From technical audit work to the continuing flow of allegations involving falsifications of background investigations and abuse of authority. The OPM Inspector General has investigated a number of case uh, a number of cases involving the falsification of background investigations, including reporting of investigations that never occurred, recording answers to questions that were never asked, and document records uh, checks that were never conducted. Within the military departments at 81 percent of OPM's customer bases, these uh, cases have serious national security implications. Inspector General McFarland testified before the Federal Workforce Subcommittee in June, and he said the OPM's revolving fund programs have been operating in the shadows for too long, adding the oft-cited uh, phrase, sunshine is the best disinfectant. H.R. 2860 would allow the OPM IG to use a portion of the revolving, money, uh, revolving fund's money to pay for related audit investigation work. The OPM IG's resources would be limited to one-third of one percent of the revolving fund budget, and the IG would be required to submit an annual budget request and report detailing its revolving fund oversight work. H.R. 2860 provides resources for critical oversight that can be accomplished at relatively low cost using existing funds. I urge the adoption of this bipartisan bill and reserve the balance of my time. Everyone reserves its time. Who seeks recognition? General Marilyn is recognized. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I yield myself such time as I may consume. General uh, is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I rise in strong support of H.R. 2860, the OPM IG Act, which is a successful product of the bipartisan efforts of Federal Workforce Subcommittee Chairman Fernald and Ranking Member Lynch, and I applaud them for their efforts. I thank my distinguished colleagues for their work and commitment in sponsoring legislation to provide the Inspector General of the Office of Personnel Management with critically needed funding to perform audits, investigations, and oversight of OPM's revolving fund activities. Through the revolving fund, OPM provides approximately $2 billion in services to agencies on a fee for service basis. These services include background investigations, leadership training, and human resource management. H.R. 2860 would fix the loophole in the current law which prevents this $2 billion revolving fund from paying for the cost of OPM's Inspector General to properly oversee the fund's activities. This legislation would allow the OPM Inspector General to use a very small portion of the revolving fund budget up to a maximum of one-third of one percent of the fund to pay for audit, investigative, and oversight work. The recent Navy shooting and the Edward Snowden leaks of classified information have highlighted the importance of comprehensive oversight of the federal government's background investigation and security clearance process. During last June's Federal Workforce Subcommittee hearing on OPM's revolving fund, the OPM Inspector General expressed substantial concerns about the falsification of background investigations. The OPM Investor, uh, Inspector General plays a crucial part in ensuring that background investigations and this process used by the government to determine whether individuals should be trusted with our nation's classified and sensitive information is properly conducted. This legislation would give the OPM Inspector General the funds and the resources needed to conduct the necessary oversight activities to help safeguard our government against national security risks. The Senate has already passed a substantially similar bill, and I ask all of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to join me in supporting H.R. 2860. With that, I reserve the balance of my time. General reserves his time. General from Texas. Thank you very much, and uh, I would like to uh, 
to thank Mr. Cummings and uh, Mr. Lynch for working together in such a bipartisan manner on this uh, very important national security bill. It's a common sense good government bill that's designed to use existing funds that are brought in to the OPM to oversee the OPM. They've got a huge chunk of money here that are coming from the background checks and don't have the resources necessary to adequately make sure these background checks are going to be done. Mr. Cummings uh, the, uh, cited uh, numerous examples of how the failures in the system have resulted in tragedies and uh, have resulted in the information getting out. We need to make sure these background checks are being done properly. We need to make sure this money is being administered properly, and this bipartisan bill does that. And I, too, urge my colleagues to uh, pass the bill and reserve. Who seeks recognition? Speaker, I want to yield uh, five minutes to the uh, co sponsor of the bill and the subcommittee. Uh, on uh, the workforce, federal workforce, to uh, I'll yield him five minutes, and uh, Mr. Lynch from uh, Massachusetts. Gentleman from Massachusetts is recognized. Thank you. I thank the ranking member uh, for yielding. And uh, first of all, I, wa I want to say that uh, as the ranking Democrat on the subcommittee on federal workforce, I rise in strong support of, of Mr. Farenthold's uh, measure here, H.R. 2860, the OPM Inspector General Act. Uh, legislation that will enhance oversight of the background check process for the issuance of government security clearances. Uh, and at the outset as well, I would like to thank the subcommittee chairman, Mr. Farenthold, for working in a bipartisan manner uh, to sponsor H.R. 2860. I'd like also like to thank uh, our full committee chairman, Mr. Issa, and ranking member, uh, Mr. Cummings, the gentleman from Maryland, for their hard work and their leadership on this legislation as well. Uh, recent events involving Edward Snowden and his leaking of classified information, and as well Aaron Alexis and the tragic shooting at the Washington Navy Yard have called attention to the need to re-examine and improve the federal government's background investigation and security clearance process. H.R. 2860 is a key component of our examination, and this legislation provides the Inspector General of the Office of Personnel Management with the resources that he needs to assist Congress in our review and oversight of a process that is critical within our national security framework. We rely heavily on, on our inspectors general. They are at the front lines of investigating uh, fraud, waste, and abuse in government programs, and uh, we as, as members of the legislature rely heavily on them in getting accurate information. In particular, H H.R. 2860 would give the Office of Personnel Management the authority to access a portion of OPM's revolving fund to pay for audits, investigations, and oversight of the agency's revolving fund program, which include the federal government's background investigation process, their leadership training fund, and personnel management solutions. I thank the OPM Inspector General Patrick McFarlane did a great job on this in making us aware of the necessity for this legislation. Uh, during a June 2013 Federal Workforce Subcommittee hearing, as has been noted, uh, Mr. McFarland stated that his office was handicapped in its ability to conduct proper oversight of the OPM's revolving fund activities. Under existing law, the Inspector General's oversight costs cannot be charged to the revolving fund, and as a result, for fiscal year 2013, the Inspector General had only available $3 million to conduct oversight of OPM's program involving $2 billion. Because of these limited resources, the OPM Inspector General was not able to thoroughly investigate issues regarding falsification of background investigations and conducting audits of the revolving fund or examine the fund's high-risk areas. However, H.R. 2860, when enacted, would allow the OPM Inspector General oversight costs to be paid from the revolving fund up to a maximum of one-third of one percent of OPM's revolving fund budget. Assuming a revolving budget of $2 billion, the Inspector General may be authorized to receive to a maximum of $6 million to fund oversight costs. The common sense indicates that giving the OPM Inspector General authority for this funding is a sensible and prudent investment. Uh, moreover, if national security is implicated, the importance of preventing or mitigating national security threats is, of course, immeasurable. Let me also add that this proposal was included in the President's fiscal year 2014 budget request and the Senate passed by unanimous consent of substantially similar legislation last October. 
In addition, a provision granting the OPM Inspector General access to the revolving fund was included in the omnibus appropriation bill released just last night. And I would note, however, that that provision expires after one year. So uh, Mr. Farenthold's uh, legislation, uh, which I have co-sponsored, is incredibly important and, uh, and, and should, be, should be adopted. So I, I urge my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to join with myself and Mr. Cummings and Mr. Farenthold in supporting 2860, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Texas. Thank recognized. you very much. And if I could in inquire the gentleman from Maryland if he has any additional speakers. We, we have no additional speakers, Mr. Speaker. Uh, well, at this point, I'd like to wrap it up and close. Gentleman from Texas recognized. Come on. Thank you very much. Um, Again, as, as the gentleman from Virginia and the gentleman from Maryland have pointed out, this is common sense, a good government bill that has, uh, has strong national security uh, implications. Um, and I, I'm going to urge to... Uh, I'm going to urge all my colleagues to support it. Uh, again, even though it was uh, included in, uh, in the omnibus that's coming through, that's one year. This creates permanent law where we continue to do this necessary and appropriate uh, oversight at a fraction of a percent uh, of the cost of the budget. Uh, absolutely a, uh, a, a phenomenal bill that uh, we, we all need to get behind and support. Someone yields back his time. I just mm -hmm. yield myself such so something I may consume as I close. Um, Mr. Speaker, I, I take this moment to um, thank Mr. Fernald, to thank Mr. Lynch, and certainly our chairman, Chairman Issa, for this bipartisan effort. It, is, it just makes sense. Um, there are certain things that happen uh, that we see in government that need correcting, um, and this is one of those things. And the fact that we have now put a spotlight on it and through a bipartisan effort, have put together uh, a legislation that should pass this House unanimously. Um, it just shows what can be done. And so um, it's a great piece of legislation. It's a very practical piece of legislation. And it's one that is needed. And with that, I would urge all of our colleagues to vote in favor of this legislation. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I yield back. Gentleman yield yields back. back. Yield back. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and agree to House Resolution 28 to H.R. 2860? Those in favor say aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, two-thirds being in the affirmative. I ask for the yeas and nays. Yeas and nays are requested. All those in favor of taking this vote. But the yeas and nays will rise and remain until counted. This, a sufficient number having risen, the yeas and nays are ordered. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, further proceedings on this motion will be postponed. What purpose the gentleman from Texas? seek to be recognized. Mr. Speaker, I move the House to spin the rules and pass H.R. 1233 as amended. The clerk will report the title of the bill. H.R. 1233, a bill to amend Chapter 22 of Title 44 of the United States Code, popularly known as the Presidential Records Act, to establish procedures for the consideration of claims as constitutionality-based privilege against disclosure of presidential records and for other purposes. Pursuant to the rule, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Farenthold, and the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummins, will each control 20 minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I yield myself as much time as I may consume. The gentleman's recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I also ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days with which to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous material in the bill under consideration. Objection so ordered. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, H.R. 1233 would codify the existing executive order that requires former presidents to appeal to incumbent presidents to keep certain presidential documents privileged under the Presidential Records Act. This bill would lock into statute a process established by President Ronald Reagan in 1989 and restored by President Obama in 2009 and used without controversy by four of the last five presidents.
The bill would ensure greater transparency for the privilege extension request by former presidents and help prevent abuses of the system. The bill does not expand the limits of executive privilege, nor would it give former presidents custodial rights over their administration's presidential records. Let me say that again to make perfectly clear, Mr. Speaker. The bill does not expand the limits of the executive privilege, nor does it give former presidents custodial rights over their administration's president presidential records. What the bill does is shift the focus from the technology used to capture and store information to the information itself. Historically, federal record keeping has uh, taken a medium-focused approach to keeping records. In a world where technological advances uh, rapidly and equipment and software become obsolete in months instead of years, making agencies focus their efforts on preserving all information rather than the information in certain forms ensures a more robust historical record and does so without constant legislative updating. H.R. 1233 would also create a framework uh, to end the all-too-common practice of executive branch employees using personal email, IM, instant messages, and similar technologies to engage in official federal business. Specifically, the bill requires official business done on personal accounts be forwarded to an official account within five days and authorize negative personnel actions against individuals who intentionally violate this disclosure requirement. The bill would also phase out paper-focused relics of the current federal record-keeping law. The bill would change the so-called 30-year presumption, which lets federal agencies hold on to their records for a 30-year period before turning them over to the National Archives, a rule which, in the current environment, all but guarantees the information will disappear as the technology used to store that information changes. Imagine delivering punch cards today to the National Archives. It would be a massive challenge to try to make that in a readable form today. As Betamax tapes, we see technology change and the need for this to uh, be updated. Uh, it would also make it much easier for agencies to turn over their records to the National Archives sooner. This bill would also eliminate the so-called print-to-file rule, which actually encourages agencies to print out their uh, electronic files and send the paper to the National Archives. Archaic rules like these actually stand in the way of effective record keeping. And this I'll uh, uh, reserve and... Uh, General reserves his time. General from Maryland is recognized. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I yield myself such time as I may consume. General is recognized. First of all, Mr. Speaker, I want to uh, begin by thanking Chairman Issa uh, for, for his supporting uh, this legislation and for making this a bipartisan effort. The Presidential and Federal Records Act amendments is aimed at giving the American people access to the records presidents create while they are in office. Under the Presidential Records Act, a president has discretion to restrict access to his records for up to 12 years after he leaves office. After that time, a president can continue to restrict access to his records by arguing that the records are protected by executive privilege. The President Presidential Records Act does not currently include guidelines for the consideration of presidential privilege claims. This bill would amend the law by adding procedures to ensure the timely release of presidential records. Under the bill, current and former presidents would have up to 90 days to object to the release of records or those records would be released. The Presidential and Federal Records Act also would require that any assertion of privilege by a former president be affirmed by the incumbent president or through a court order. The bill we are considering today also makes clear that the right to assert the privilege is personal to current and former presidents, and it cannot be bequeathed to assistants, relatives, or descendants. Putting this language into statute will ensure that future presidents are held to the standard first set by President Reagan. The Chairman of the Oversight Committee, Representative Darrell Issa, added an amendment during the committee markup of the bill 
to address the use of personal email by federal employees. There's nothing currently in the Presidential Records Act or the Federal Records Act that prohibits employees from using personal email accounts to conduct official business. These acts simply require preservation of these records. This bill will continue to allow employees to use their personal email account when necessary, but it would require employees to copy their official email account or forward their email to their official account. This is a good government bill. Similar versions of this bill overwhelmingly passed the House in two previous Congresses. I urge my colleagues to support H.R. 1233 so that the Senate can take it up quickly and so that it might be sent on to the President for his signature. And with that, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves his time. The gentleman from Texas is recognized. Thank you very much. And I stand with Mr. Cummings in uh, supporting this uh, good government bill that continues to uh, preserve information from the federal government for historians and future generations, adapts to modern technology, and closes the loophole with respect to uh, private email accounts. And I'm, I'm, I'm a huge supporter. Happy we're working uh, together in a bipartisan manner on these and other uh, good government bills and I'll continue to reserve. I'm going to reserve. Gentleman Maryland is recognized. I yield myself such time as I may, Councilman, as Gentleman's I close. Recognized. Uh, I, again, I want to thank the gentleman for yielding. I want to thank uh, our chairman and the members of our committee for making this happen. Uh, again, there are situations where we find the law needs clarification. This is one of their cl those clarifying opportunities, and we have taken advantage of it in a bipartisan way. And again, I would urge all of our members to vote in favor of this legislation. And with that, I yield back. Gentleman yields his time. Gentleman Texas recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, uh, I join the gentleman from Maryland in urging uh, my colleagues to support H.R. 1233 and yield back the remainder of my time. Gentleman yields his time. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass H.R. 1233 those, as amended? Those in favor say aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, two-thirds being in the... I'd like to request Texas. the yeas and nays. The yeas and nays are requested. All those in favor of taking this vote by the yeas and nays will rise and remain standing until counted. A sufficient number has risen. The yeas and nays are ordered. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, further proceedings on this motion will be postponed. Pursuant to Clause 12A of Rule 1, the Chair declares the House in recess. Subject to call the Chair. Thank you. We expect the House to gavel back in sometime in the 5 o'clock Eastern hour. We'll have live coverage, of course, earlier today by a voice vote. They approved a short-term continuing resolution to keep the government funded for three days past tomorrow's deadline in order that the House and Senate can work out uh, differences and finish up work on the year-long uh, omnibus spending bill through the end of the fiscal year anyway. And when they come back, a couple of votes on a bill dealing with the Inspector General of the Office of Personnel Management and the Presidential Records Act. Meanwhile, over on the Senate side, they'll gavel back in. They've gaveled back in, and we might see some votes coming up shortly dealing with the unemployment insurance extension. Reporters indicating that after the uh, Democratic meeting today, uh, Senator Reid announcing he will start allowing votes on more amendments on the Senate floor. You can follow Senate debate he, on C-SPAN 2 and the House here on C-SPAN.